Today on the INSA Horizon stage, Daniel Serowitz, Emeritus Professor at the Arizona State University and recently retired Editor-in-Chief of the esteemed Issues in Science and Technology Journal. Discussing issues of evidence and democracy with Professor Serowitz is Sabina Leonelli, Professor of Philosophy and History of Science at the University of Exeter. So thank you very much. Um, it is a fantastic honor to be here with all of you at INSA today, and especially to be in conversation with uh, Daniel Sarowitz, who is, of course, a world leading contributor to science and technology studies, and specifically to his intersection with science policy, and has helped uh, all of us in the field and well beyond uh, to understand the continuing co-evolution of humans and technology, what is termed the techno-human condition. Um, Dan has been a leader in uh, something which I think has transformed um, the policy environment uh, around science uh, over the last few years, the idea of responsible innovation, and has been a very long-standing contributor to science policy debates, uh, particularly in the States, but also worldwide. So uh, I'm particularly honored that we now have the chance to have a conversation around two very, very important topics that are now constantly intersecting in the contemporary world, which are the ideas of evidence and democracy. And I really couldn't imagine a, a better um, person to have this conversation with. Uh, so thank you very much, Dan, for being here with us today. So uh, I would say maybe let's start the conversation um, by talking as a starting point um, from something that is, everything, is on everybody's mind these days, certainly, um, which is the pandemic and the ideas around evidence that have been circulating in association to the pandemic. And certainly what we've been witnessing all around the world um, is a cacophony of supposedly science-led decision-making and claims to that effect. So uh, maybe let's start this conversation by reflecting on what evidence-led policy really supposed to mean for contemporary politics in the aftermath of the first 18 months of the pandemic. Yeah, um, well, first, let me just say thanks for the uh, embarrassing intro, Sabina. Uh, it's, it's actually great for me to be able to have a chance to chat with you. And of course, um, watching INSA develop over the last uh, five or six years, especially under Peter Gluckman's leadership has been uh, a great thing because it says, I think, something about the, the, the our community coming of age in, a, in an important way. Um, so uh, to start off by talking with COVID means we're really diving into the deep end here um, uh, because I think what COVID has done is put starkly on display for everybody to see the sorts of issues that maybe up until now have mostly seemed kind of the rarefied uh, purview of science policy and science studies uh, um, academics and scholars. Um, so um, uh, it's both a great place to start, but maybe we should also um, uh, be a little more specific first about thinking about the word evidence and what it actually has, has it means and how that has um, how that's on display in the in, in in the COVID crisis because what everyone sees is exactly what you know what you quickly um, and eloquently described right a a, um, a kind of cacophony of of evidence of claims of fact claims of truth claims of claims of authority of claims of speaking for science um, and uh, a, a let's say a melange of policy responses of uh, different countries um, all presumably um, uh, with access to the, the best experts in the world choosing different policy pathways um, so I think one thing that it's illustrating is the idea of evidence cannot be separated from the ideas of governance and policy and democracy, um, and we can get to that. Uh, we can get to that later. But but um, maybe a first place to start is that it reveals that evidence is not this thing out there to be grabbed and plugged into a policy. Um, evidence is uh, itself a kind of complicated. Um, idea and and terms like I think COVID reveals that terms like evidence-based policy are at best kind of shallow um, and at worst maybe kind of deceptive uh, and so what we're seeing is that uh, it's a complicated world and evidence is something we create um, we choose what to uh, 
what to measure, what to assess, what to describe as evidence, what to give validity to. Um, we don't choose it utterly arbitrarily, of course, but it's a rich world and we have many options. And uh, and so if you think about just a, uh, an issue like mask wearing policies, um, there's plenty of um, what one might call science out there dating back really more than a century, um, both that can be used to guide a variety of policies and that can be used to um, uh, to support a variety of political positions in the U.S. where mask wearing has become a kind of a uh, political hot button around questions of what, what authority does government have to tell me what to do. Um, uh, there's lots of uh, information that people who are interested in, in that particular perspective on mask wearing that they can call on um, as evidence for their position. So the politics become very, very difficult, maybe acutely difficult in this country. Um, so, so I think one thing COVID does is it simply shows that the word evidence is, is a word that needs to be um, not just thrown around as if it's some equivalent of, of rationality or, or uh, uh, agreed upon truth. It's, a, it's a, um, a troubling kind of grab bag that often has political content in and of itself because it's associated with words like uh, science and truth. Um, and, and then I guess the other point I'd make just to begin with is, is Evidence is often, the word is often used specifically for contested situations, right? So if you think about the courtroom, which I think is a really interesting um, kind of institutional setting to, to, to un unwind some of these issues, evidence is something that both sides get, right? And both sides get experts. Um, so evidence, again, is not this thing that's out there waiting to be found um, and applied to a policy, but it is a, uh, it's, it's really, in some sense, it describes a process by which people make sense of the world as they see it and want to see it and would like to see it in the future. Absolutely, of course, and, and it's very interesting indeed to see this idea of evidence being uh, bound around as if it was the equivalent to the term facts. Right. When in fact, as you just pointed out, Dan, um, very often the, the idea of evidence is in fact used as a deciding fact, something which intervenes in a controversy or helps you to resolve a dilemma, helps you to take a decision in a particularly controversial situation. But then what makes the decisive part of this is the interpretation that is given in a very particular political context. So it becomes, and I think indeed um, the COVID um, crisis it continues to show how impossible it is to um, disentangle the um, ensemble of models, data and claims that are produced by different types of scientists and the different types of interpretations that parts of society attribute to those in their particular context and is all trying to arbitrate across that. But of course, um, if one then takes the starting point in thinking about evidence, um, one of the big issues that immediately comes up is the issue of trust. Uh, because then questions around what are our sources for the evidence that we use, particularly when those sources are likely not just to give you data and models, but also particular ways of interpreting those data and models um, become really, really important. Um, so what do you think um, could be a takeaway lesson in that respect? particularly in a situation where uh, the sources of evidence, especially in the States, have become so polarized. And there is almost a sanitized view of what counts as evidence, depending on which political camp you're part of. Yeah, this is really troubling. And again, you can help me situate this um, in the, in, at least in the European context as well in the US context. And, and I know these problems are not unique to the US, although maybe they're uh, especially acute here. Um, but uh, the, the, the trust question to me gets to the essence of, of, of what is going on. Um, let me just say, just backing up a little bit, that, that uh, I, I agree that evidence is used um, often to indicate deciding facts, but, but we should also um, recognize that, that I'm a big believer in facts. Um, there are lots of them out there. And so uh, the idea of deciding facts is itself a, um, uh, a description of a political process. What facts do we gather? How do we assemble them? And how do we translate into what we want to do to achieve what we're after, which of course um, is, is uh, suffused with values. So the, so the idea again that, and to some extent this gets to, to um, 
attention maybe at the heart of INCSA, right, which is, is the idea of, of science advice um, as something um, that has to do with translating evidence and fact into policy and politics. I think what one thing we're saying and seeing with COVID is, is um, that's th limiting that to the idea of, say, the wise counselor or advisors whispering in the ear of the, um, of the policymaker um, is, is kind of not operable in the world that we uh, live in today, that, that what we're actually talking about is this complex amalgam and how things get translated from the processes by which we filter and decide on which facts and evidence to use to the decision process. So how, how, is, how is it that that goes on? And I think what you're suggesting um, which I totally agree with, uh, is that at the core of this is some is this fuzzy concept of trust. Why do people accept certain decisions and not, and not other decisions? Why do things become uh, controversial? Um, and I don't um, in, claim to be able to answer answer those questions, but I think it's interesting that the obsession, at least in the U.S., especially on the left of center side, with evidence and facts. Um, puts, I think, the cart ahead of the horse because it assumes that the institutions that are conveying this information have the legitimacy and authority for people to accept what's being said. Um, if they don't, then the particular set of facts and evidence that's been assembled to lead to a particular decision is automatically going to come, come into question. I think that's what's happening here. Um, now, it was obviously accelerated in this country by uh, a president, our previous president, Donald Trump, who had seemed to have a, a, a take a delight in undermining institutions and institutional authorities. But, um, but I think he's probably a, 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 a symptom, not a cause of this. Uh, I think we see lots of evidence of it going on in lots of contexts that are, that are separate from just, uh, just the mischief that, that Trump might have created. So, um, so the question of of what can we say about institutions that engender sufficient trust, have sufficient um, uh, social legitimacy to, to gather evidence that's then used to make decisions. I think maybe that's the kind of core of what we might want to be might want to be talk, talking about here. There's obviously no uh, there's no simple answer, but I think we can certainly look around us and see that there are places that still do have uh, social trust. Um, maybe it's simply because they're not, not in the political spotlight. Maybe if anything's put in the political spotlight, that kind of trust will erode. But, but there's lots of things that people have confidence in, and there's lots of evidence and facts that people accept without really questioning it. So, so um, uh, the, the, the issue of what's, what is COVID telling us about the bigger world, I think, is a, is a, is a complex one. But certainly one thing it's telling us is that um, uh, trust in centralized authorities making pronouncements about evidence based on science um, is not what it used to be. Um, and we can talk about why, why that is. Yeah, that's absolutely clear. I guess what's interesting also when you look at it from the European context is that what we have uh, here on this side of the pond is a slightly different situation. Of course, we don't have that kind of uh, radical bipartisanship that seems to be characteristic of US politics at the moment. But we've had such diversity within the European context in terms of how much the scientific establishment went for, or even institutions in general, went for choosing a spokesperson for the truth around COVID, or at least the accepted political interpretation of COVID-related science, um, versus just having a pluralism of views. And there's pros and cons to both models, but it's certainly been very interesting to witness that. So for instance, in Germany, in the UK, in France, the choice has been very clear to have a spokesperson that was um, you know, kind of linked to uh, national institutions around uh, public health that would come along and uh, either nod alongside whatever the prime minister was saying in the case of the UK, or actually make announcements also on behalf of the government for what the accepted wisdom around the current state of the pandemic was, as in the case of Germany. A case like Italy um, is very interesting because that's not what happened there. What happened there was Basically, there wasn't really a spokesperson chosen among the many different Italian institutions that are um, able to make pronouncements around science and public health decisions. And so it's been, uh, you know, a, you know a, basically the media have been littered by authoritative scientific figures, 
immunologists to um, microbiologists to um, um, heads of hospitals to uh, public health authorities who are making their own pronouncements and giving their own reading of the situation. But even in that case, you know, on the one hand, there was a very nice display of pluralism, but that also generated a tremendous amount of confusion. Um, and, and it's interesting to see in all of those different um, realities, all of those different ways of dealing with evidence within this democratic space, there have been pretty, in some cases, violent reactions against um, any measure perceived to be um, constraining freedom or anyhow uh, restraining uh, the behavior of populations to try and cope with the pandemic. Yeah, well, so think, and another, uh, another great example of that, again, viewed from afar, was the debate around the uh, um, safety of the, was it the, the GlaxoSkyne vaccine? Um, the AstraZeneca one, I guess. The AstraZeneca, yeah. yeah, sorry, AstraZeneca the vaccine. Um, uh, which seemed like a really interesting, almost textbook case of, of um, issues of risk framing and culture and risk, uh, where my take, and you can tell me if this is right, was that there was a really interesting divide between um, the kind of government expert view of things and the kind of more public uh, perception, but that was very much um, uh, um, supported by certain members of the scientific community. So it was a, um, it, it, it's, that's the kind of thing that happened here as well, but it was very, it seemed very conspicuous. And the framing here often in the media was, you know, well, the number of people dying from blood clots was no more than background in any case. So why are people so worried, which is a standard kind of, you know, rationality and risk framing of things. But um, it didn't seem to really address the, the deeper issue of why are people unwilling to accept these pronouncements? So. Yeah. And I guess actually that's a very interesting example to bring in uh, because it also brings us to a uh, you know, a, a factor in all of these uh, decisions, which I think has been there, of course, for a, for a long, long time, but is probably taking um, darker, possibly undertones, particularly when one thinks about evidence, which is the issue of a uh, commercial interest and commercial entities involved in these kinds of debates. Um, certainly when it comes to the AstraZeneca debate in Europe, a big part of this arguably, or at least I would argue, had to do with uh, particular ways in which uh, the pharmaceutical company that was um, supporting the vaccine was posing itself, the ways in which it was negotiating with different governments and with the commission, the ways in which it was releasing its own data and the extent to which it was making it accessible to others. And of course, we can think about that in relation to COVID vaccination, but we can think about this also in relation to lots of other aspects of data and of uh, evidence from climate change and the role of um, companies dealing with fossil fuels, of course, in procuring evidence in that space, but also to all the different ways in which personal data are now being appropriated through social media, very often owned um, by different kinds of corporations and very often rather centralized at that. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, you know, I guess one of the latest, latest examples of the last two weeks is the fact um, of the revelation that the Taliban in Afghanistan have been um, really um, studying up on biometric um, technologies and they're using facial recognition technologies and the fact that we have in so much media coverage of that crisis and of course many many pictures in which people who are trying to escape the country are very clearly identifiable um, on pictures and there's a whole question around uh, what that's going to create in that context so i was wondering i mean given the incredible body of work you've done on all of those issues what do you think this enormous shifts in political economy, particularly around data and the technologies of data and data policy, affect even what we mean by science policy at the moment. Yeah, and of course, yeah. what, what we mean by evidence-laid policy. This is a, I mean, uh, this is an enormous question and an enormous challenge, and I'm not going to pretend to have any particular um, uh, in, in, insights here. Obviously, there's a privatization of a huge amount of private information, but there's also um, uh, an enormous landscape of public information that anyone can have access to as well. Um, uh, someone who's skilled at web searching can find out lots of personal information about anybody that they want. But I think that, uh, I guess one thing I'd say to just push back a little is I, I um, although I'm no 
uh, truster of big corporations and their motives. I just see them as another player in the landscape. Um, I don't see them as particularly an axis of evil or anything. I'll, I'll give you an example that's, um, that maybe helps complexify it. Um, there was a really interesting controversy starting in June when our uh, Food and Drug Administration approved a new um, Alzheimer's drug. Uh, the first, actually, first drug to really be approved called, uh, it's called Aduhelm, and it's uh, produced by the company Biogen. Now, um, this is a really interesting instance of uh, evidence-based decision-making because the, um, the advisory committee to FDA advised against approving this drug because it turned out that the drug showed uh, that it did reduce amyloid plaque in the brain, which is, according to the ruling hypothesis, the cause of Alzheimer's, but it didn't show any clinical efficacy. Okay, so uh, the panel did not. The panel which voted on this did not. Uh, this is an advisory panel. They didn't have. Uh, they don't have authority to make the decision, but they advised the FDA. They voted not to approve this drug, but the FDA approved it. And um, of course, one angle of that is, well, here's this company, Biogen, perhaps putting pressure on FDA. Indeed, FDA is doing an internal investigation about this. Um, and uh, and it's going to be incredibly expensive, tens of thousands of dollars a year. And there's lots of people with Alzheimer's. And so, um, uh, so this is clearly just an example of, of the agency being bought by, uh, by a company. But the fact is, the Alzheimer's community, the patient community, um, was very much in favor of the approval of this drug overall. I'm sure that wasn't, isn't 100% true, but their uh, activist arms, so this is an example of democratization of science and evidence, was very much in favor of it because their view was, look, you know, maybe the efficacy isn't proven, but, um, but the drug seems to be safe. There's some indications that it might be efficacious and we're willing to take the risk. Um, so this is an example of where you could say a kind of more democratically driven uh, decision also aligns with the interests of the private sector in a way that uh, contravened the formal um, way that science evidence is evaluated and provided. And indeed, a couple of members of that advisory committee quit because they were so unhappy with the decision. So, so I just think what we're seeing now is just an incredible complexification of the information, data, and evidence landscape. And, um, and so uh, this, I think, in a way, does lead back to the trust question because one might ask, you know, where then will this, the, the venues, the lo loci of institutional trust be able to emerge where we will actually be able to make decisions that are not um, uh, that are not subject to this kind of um, uh, pluralization of evidence, uh, uh, science, policy, and, and and values. I think it's a it's it's a challenge. Uh, there's, I, I, I'm I'm a little hesitant to offer this um, analogy because because I don't know anything about the historical analogy, but it does. On, on the kind of surface, it, it, it feels a little like, you know, Gutenberg and vernacular Bibles um, and the destabilization they had on the authority of the church prior to the Reformation. Suddenly, this thing that was the authority in saying we speak with truth, um, that is the mainstream institutions of science, is thrown into question, not because science isn't still doing its job, but because we're finally seeing the complexity of reality and science's limits and strengths coming in, coming into full view through COVID. So it's a pretty uncomfortable time. Absolutely. And I guess even what counts as an institution that has this kind of legitimizing, democratizing power becomes a very big question. I guess many people would argue something like Google is in fact the de facto yeah. pluralizing institution of our time where you know the the argument is well this is where many views can be publicized this is where um, many views can be um, can be make heard where we can find many different voices and potentially compare them and therefore we could regard google itself as you know possibly the most prominent, one of the most prominent institutions of our time in affecting this kind of work. And at the same time, this doesn't quite seem right when thinking about um, an institution that can uh, think about pluralism in a, in a wider yeah. sense. Because Google is not stabilizing, it's actually de destabilizing. And, and um, because it's, I mean, in some ways, right, this is the, this is, 
this is a be careful what you wish for um, situation because knowledge and evidence is now truly democratized and Google in some sense is a tool uh, for doing this. And it's not just among the unwashed masses. I imagine that there is no one listening, having the misfortune to listen to me drawn on here, um, who has not uh, used Google Scholar to find the papers that they needed to support the argument that they wanted to make in a rigorous academic paper, right? So it's an incredibly powerful tool, but it's also an incredible tool for reinforcing our cognitive biases and our, uh, our, our views of the world. And we all have those, of course. So, um, so in, in, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, example because in some ways I think you're exactly right, but but it has this this profound double edgedness or paradoxicalness to it because it's really also this the a key source of of um, a, a kind of vulcanizing pluralism too. Absolutely, and I guess for those of us who are working on algorithms, we're also aware of the kind of bias that the particular uh, search engines that are uh, mobilized within Google can bring. But I guess then this raises, then going back to the question that you were asking, which I think is absolutely crucial at this time, what does an institution look like that is supposed to have this kind of um, legitimizing um, or at least coordinating power, to, to put it mildly. Um, let's consider something like international organizations, something even like INSA itself yeah. and other organizations in the space like the International Council of Science, um, one could argue even the WHO. I mean, what role do you think these kinds of supposedly global organizations can play in all of this? Yeah, um, well, maybe the first thing to be said is is uh, avoiding a retreat into no longer um, uh, no longer plausible tropes about evidence and policy would be a really good place to start a hard place to start but a good place to start and a um, uh, a recognition that that trust does that, that institutions really are the things that that condition our ability our ability to act. Um, uh, again, without knowing much about this, I, I remember having fascinating conversations with with Peter Gluckman in the past about the difference between the science advisory mechanism in New Zealand and in the U.S. In the U.S., the science advisor is a political appointee. Um, in New Zealand, that's not the case. Um, and so that's just a simple example. It doesn't mean that the science advisor in New Zealand doesn't have opinions and doesn't select evidence uh, based on those opinions, but at least a plausible case can be made um, that that is an institution um, that is uh, uh, at least aware of the need to separate the, the process of choosing evidence from making decisions. Um, uh, uh, it, whereas in the US, that case can't be made. Um, the, 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 the advisor is a political appointee. They're part of the regime and they report to the president and are expected to be loyal to the president. So, um, so one thing we might do is just look around um, for places that that um, seem to uh, operate um, in, in a way that, that uh, um, uh, it can handle the, the kinds of stresses of this, this kind of radically pluralized, balkanized bulk, evidence. Um, ultimately, people are going to have to be asked to, to, to um, accept decisions. And right now, we seem to also be in an era where um, there's not a lot of comfort with the fact that uh, you don't get to be right about everything and don't get to your way on everything. And I don't know what to do about that, except to say that um, I'd rather have democracies dealing with that than any other form of government, because we're still not mostly killing each other over these sorts of things. So maybe this is just the way it's going to look. Um, but that being said, I, again, I do think we can look at certain uh, at, at certain institutions. And so, you, you know, you, you say, well, what would that suggest for INSA? I, I think it would suggest um, an awareness uh, that INSA needs to be very open um, about understanding the problematic nature of claims of evidence and policy. Um, it could even have a... Um, uh, a, a, a role in in making it seem more okay and normal that we have these debates around evidence that they don't mean that there's one side that's rational or one side that's irrational and that there's a right answer. Um, so it might have it might be able to have a kind of salutary effect in in calming people down about the current uh, current situation. Yes. Um, 
And of course, I mean, one of the interesting things I was thinking, one of the maybe unexpected institutions, if I may call it such, that has entered this fray over the last uh, two or three years is the journal Nature itself. It's been quite interesting to see the evolution of that from a journal that actually would have been taking very much the hardcore view of science as harbinger of truth and nothing more until pretty much three or four years ago. And now over the last few years, uh, really developing a much more nuanced and sophisticated view of the value-laden nature of science and the intersections between science and policy. And of course, uh, quite a few scientists uh, even have resented that, uh, thinking that this was going too far. But at least in my view, it has presented quite an interesting set of opinions even as the uh, COVID uh, crisis was evolving. And uh, the question then becomes whether some of our scholarly societies and institutions can provide similar levels of reflexivity. This is a wonderful point, and, and um, I, I'm thoroughly biased here because, because um, nature allowed me to write a column for them um, uh, irregularly over, over about a decade, um, and they were very open to uh, these sorts of ideas. The editor-in-chief, uh, Phil Campbell, um, had quite a sensitivity to this. I agree in the last few years, um, they've they've really uh, embraced uh, many of these ideas. So, so um, this might be a fantastic example of how within the scientific community institutions can grow that accommodate what is going on. Um, uh, uh, nature gets hammered, as does um, all of the high profile uh, magazines for for. Um, uh, perhaps accepting scientific articles that are likely to get more clicks than necessarily more rigorous, but uh, being more rigorous. But but I think the, the bigger, more interesting point is the one that you made and that I hadn't thought about before, which is, is um, it has positioned itself as a place that it is both a guardian of notions of scientific rigor and quality. Um, it doesn't do that perfectly, uh, but I think we can say that it, it, it tries um, and it has integrity and it recognizes having integrity, even as it's allowing this kind of dialogue. You know, you'll recall maybe a year or two ago, um, they had a whole feature on co-production of knowledge, you know, unbelievable. The, the American version of that science would never have that kind of a thing. In fact, they're still, they're still sending uh, spam to all of the AAAS members about things like, you know, how do we prevent misinformation and how do we make sure that policy is evidence-based? So nature is way out ahead of science in that regard. So, yeah, so that's, let's just say that's a hopeful, um, uh, a hopeful development in this context. So could I maybe ask you a cheeky question and ask you what you think could be the ways in which these kinds of winds uh, could push the Biden administration over the next couple of years? Uh, well, that remains to be seen. It'll be very interesting. So in, in the U.S., um, so you talked about the, the kind of the, the, the um, single spokesperson versus kind of disseminated model of expertise. Um, uh, as many listeners will know, uh, Anthony Fauci, the head of the um, uh, uh, um, Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health, emerged as um, kind of the, the hero of the, the Trump opposition as a, a scientist spokesperson for rationality and evidence. Uh, on on behalf of uh, of the COVID, uh, uh, speaking on the COVID pandemic, and uh, of course, the the problem is when you look too closely at, at anyone who takes on that heroic role, it's possible to find contradictions, paradoxes, mistakes, and so on. So, um, so that's also provided fuel for the uh, for the opposition. Um, so, but the bigger point I want to make here, in terms of your 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 question about the Biden administration, is is there has part of the politics of being a Democrat in this country right now are seeing yourself as pro-science and rational um, and seeing the other side as anti-science and irrational. Um, and in fact, in my neighborhood, I live in Washington, D.C., it's a, about 97 percent of the voters voted for Biden. There are signs on many, many um, uh, lawns in my neighborhood that say things like Black Lives Matter um, and and science is real whatever that means. It doesn't mean anything, of course. But the point is, it has become a kind of a self-identifying, um, uh, 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 an identity label um, for the Democratic Party, which I think is actually super problematic. Um, and uh, because what it does mean is that it's going to be harder, at least publicly, for the Biden administration to adopt this kind of uh, uh, more plural, pluralistic approach. That being said, 
um, some of our friends have been appointed in the Biden administration. Uh, there are a, a couple of STSers now in the White House at the Council of Environmental Quality and the um, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy. So there's clearly some awareness of the complexities of these issues. Uh, Biden seems to be, I, I don't know if he thinks about this stuff at all. He probably doesn't have, doesn't have time to, um, but he's certainly allowed uh, what I'd say is a, a more pluralistic approach to science policy to be brought in. Um, the number isn't huge, but it's, it's somewhat reassuring to know that, that, that people that we've all, many of us have worked with are now in the administration. And we'll see whether or not uh, they can um, uh, provide a kind of a new, more complexified narrative around, around these issues. It's, a real, it's gonna be really interesting to see if that, that can happen. So maybe one, this would be one place to think a little bit more about one aspect of the debate around evidence and democracy that we sort of touched upon, but we haven't really uh, focused on, though it's, it's so central, which is the idea that some would describe as public engagement. So what happens when we think about science as something which is not just limited to what professional scientists do, but we think about it in much more complex terms as something which involves many different types of expertise, many different viewpoints, and many of them coming from members of various publics which have particular competencies and particular skills which, um, which could be harnessed and very often are harnessed uh, to produce scientific knowledge. Uh, now, this is something, again, I think the COVID example is, is useful to exemplify this, um, which to an extent is absolutely clear. I mean, it's clear that uh, during the COVID crisis, the experience of particular patient groups and patient organizations, the experience of medical frontline, um, all of those experiences, in fact, were important sources of evidence and that there's been a lot of variability in whether or not they've been recognized and taken up as such. Um, but what do you think are the prospects for public engagement and its intersection with science policy at the moment? Of course, it's a big question, but one that yeah. I think we probably need to touch upon. Can I, can I, I want to back up before getting at that. So if I forget, bring me back um, to, to the underlying point that you made, which I think is, is a really important kind of, you know, I like to use words like epistemological because it makes people think that I know what I'm talking about. So it's, I should just say I'm a geologist. Um, uh, it, it, it raises a really important epistemological question um, or issue. And one that I think, um, you know, the, 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 the transition into um, a broader understanding of what counts as legitimate knowledge is a really um, important one. Of course, for STSers, for science people who study science policy and science studies, um, this is this is no big deal. Um, but but uh, for the for the world at large, in terms of its received understanding of science, it's a really big deal. And the point is that that the, the, there's a landscape of knowledge. That's very, it's, it's very flat. It's not that there are these sources of truth in science and that everything else is somehow some kind of subsidiary, lesser important knowledge. There are, there are truths that scientists are uniquely um, uh, able to, uh, to access and to explore, especially around things that allow controlled experimentation. Um, but there are equal truths of the immediate experience of one's lives. I mean, the example of, of what uh, doctors learned during COVID when the formal knowledge was kind of crap. Um, in fact, the analogies to other uh, epidemics turned out to be very misleading in, in, in many cases. So, um, so what was going on there was that doctors had to learn by doing um, and it turned out that they had, here's an example of, of where knowledge pl pluralization and, 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 uh, and some of the things that worry us around Google and Facebook actually were beneficial. Uh, networks of, of, of hospital doctors um, using Facebook uh, were able to compare what they were learning in real time so that they could very quickly ramp up practice around things like using ventilators, which it turned out we had all the wrong intuitions about early on. So. Um, so this is an example in the kind of professional space of how um, knowledge that typically doesn't count as real knowledge because, oh, it's merely anecdotal. But of course, if this is the real practice that professionals are engaging in, um, then this is something that's very, very valuable. And we don't have often formal ways of conveying it and particularly formal ways of, of kind of accruing it so that it can become available uh, quickly to wider 
um, populations of people. So, um, so that's one example. And then another, of course, is just how people with their own experiences of COVID um, uh, learn to manage uh, the disease or not manage the disease in ways that often, and I think you've, you know, you've talked, we, we talked about this in, in the past, how the, the way data were gathered, epidemiological data were gathered um, and used to, to, to create advice didn't um, often translate into the experiences that individuals were having with COVID. Think about any um, working couple with kids in school and the incredible challenges of having their kids at, at home. Um, well, they learned a lot, of course, about those challenges, but it also was a kind of experience that didn't factor into very strongly decisions that were made about how to manage schools in the US, for example. So, um, so I think one, you know, again, one thing that COVID is showing us is that um, uh, it's not just that knowledge is plural, it's that the sources of useful, valid knowledge are also plural, and that we really need to have a much more level, kind of forgiving landscape about what counts. Now, obviously, this does raise questions about BS, about true misinformation, things introduced by by uh, uh, mischief making people or powers when it, trying to destabilize things and perhaps do things like make people not want to get vaccinated or whatever. Um, I want to put that aside. It's a problem. It's always a problem. Um, but but uh, that problem does not um, uh, address the or cover the question of the various types of valid knowledge at different scales of contextual action that science actually doesn't speak to. So this gets to your question of what does this say about participatory democracy? You know, one maybe overly glib answer might be, well, it says it's happening now, right? Um, uh, but maybe this is this also gets to the institution and trust and trust question. Um, and again, maybe it pushes us in inc uncomfortable ways. So, uh, for Alzheimer's patients, um, perhaps their their advocacy groups uh, um, are institutions that they trust more than the scientific advisory panel for the FDA. Um, so maybe what we're going to see <clears throat> is people aggregating uh, around issues for which they have considerable um, uh, considerable experience and knowledge, uh, institutions representing that experience and knowledge in the, in the political um, uh, in the political arena. Of course, this is nothing new. We know from Steve Epstein's work uh, about AIDS patients. We know that even before that, breast cancer advocates were uh, banding together to go against the experts to oppose things like radical, radical mastectomies. Um, so um, uh, disease and, and health, which of course is something that implicates people personally and for which people get lots of expertise in dealing with their own disease might be um, I'm just making this up, might be the forefront of where we're going to see certain types of institutional models that are ultimately participatory, develop a kind of trust and legitimacy that allows them to be effective players. Um, and, and right now we're at a point where we still say, well, what about the scientists? They're not scientists, they're not experts. Maybe we need to mature to the point where we can say <clears throat> they offer a kind of um, v equally valid expertise that needs to be um, uh, that needs to be part of the decision making processes. And in fact, we see that institutionalized in the nature feature on co-production. So, yeah, I mean, certainly we, we talked a lot. I think in Anxa, there's also a lot of talk, also rightly, around the extent to which new technologies are disrupting ideas around expertise and potentially. Uh, opening up avenues for different kinds of participation, but also closing down some others. But I guess maybe one of the things that has also turned out to be really important over the last couple of years is the idea of emergency and how conditions of emergency or perceived conditions of emergency are also strongly cutting through what we have assumed to be sources of evidence and authoritative source of evidence. And I guess this is a very important issue to raise, not just in relation to the pandemic, but in relation to climate change more generally, where it looks like we're heading into a world where many natural phenomena 
will be pointed at um, with ever increasing frequency as creating emergency conditions and therefore creating an environment where science needs to respond quickly. Right? And I guess for me, one of the worrying things um, in witnessing some of these emergency discourse or you know, under disaster conditions type of science is to some extent, um, and it, some of the conservatism attached to some of that, particularly in science advisory environments, in the UK, uh, when the pandemic exploded, the people that were called by the government as experts were modelers, mathematicians, yeah. right? And very mathematical type epidemiologists. Now, of course, these people were great people to call, but it was very surprising that they were the only people that were called. Or anyhow, there was a very restricted view of what would be, in a conservative sense, the best type of expertise. Yeah. And, uh, and the excuse, or at least the reasoning behind it, was very often this idea of emergency science. We have to go with the best we have, and then, sure, then we'll consult others. And it's not really clear to me that that was the best thing to do. And so uh, the question at this point for us is, how do we intersect with this um, constantly evolving claims to authority that are happening yeah. both within the scientific profession and uh, beyond it? This is super interesting. So, so I'm going to offer a hypothesis here that I haven't thought about be before, but um, it and it's this that that emergencies. I, I totally agree with what you're saying, and I and I think um, this is something we need to talk about a lot more in uh, with regard to, to climate change, especially on the on the left in the U.S. Um, uh, emergencies may uh, here's my hypothesis may turn out to be. Um, an important refuge uh, for conventional claims of expertise and monolithic um, sources of, of evidence and science. Um, because it's in conditions of emergencies when we're supposed to be willing to turn over uh, some amount of our uh, uh, democratic prerogatives um, to bigger institutions who we trust to be capable of dealing with these emergencies. So. Um, so what you say, what you're saying, uh, Sabina, to me really, really strikes home uh, as something to be uh, aware of and worried about. Um, and I think maybe uh, to think about the, the, you know, how to counter it, um, the place to go is where you went earlier to think about um, expertise as uh, as pluralistic, as not simply being uh, the purview of of uh, highly um, credentialed, qualified, often brilliant, and often um, with much relevant to offer, but uh, uh, but you know, subset of the scientific community versus uh, a much wider range of, of relevant people. So, for example, um, you know, I've been interested in in natural hazards for for you know mo most of my uh, ad adult life. And there's very, there's very interesting intersections of expertise and expertise in the scientific sense and expertise in the practical sense um, uh, in, in, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of natural hazards. I should say, backing up a little bit further, even that, that I think, like evidence, expert is a very um, complex term that is, that is uh, mobilized often to achieve um, political, uh, po political goals. Um, one interesting, uh, one interesting um, element of expertise of the sort you were referring to, modeling expertise, is um, there's actually no way to hold a modeler accountable uh, for the for the um, products of their expertise. Their models in the future, the models get diffused through policy and policy making. Very different from a practitioner expert like, say, a doctor or a, um, uh, a ship's pilot who, if they screw up, you're going to know. So I think, um, I think in these broader, more diffused types of expertise where accountability is less easy to um, uh, to, to uh, up uphold, there will be a tendency um, to see emergencies as a way of maintaining legitimacy and authority. Now, I don't want to say this in any conspiratorial way. It's going to be a natural place for them to gravitate. And we see it with climate change and we saw it with COVID. Um, so this is a democratic tension that um, uh, that's going to need to be uh, a, a addressed. It's a it's a it's another fascinating dimension of this uh, of this entire set of challenges.
Absolutely. And I guess, I mean, many of us, certainly in my case, doing a lot of work with the data science community, which is sort of defining itself at the moment. One of the big tasks is to create a sense of accountability and really think about the shape that that has, uh, both in a political sense, in a social sense, and in a technical sense, uh, which of these uh, decision making that are happening at the very technical level end up actually um, being accountable for some of the potential consequences. So certainly part of um, this broader dialogue around evidence and democracy. Um, so I guess we are now probably coming towards the end of our time, which is a pity because I'm sure we could uh, go on much further with, go on, with yes. other, other examples and, and many, many other aspects to explore. Um, but I certainly wanted to uh, take just um, a few seconds at least uh, to thank Dan for very generous intervention and just this opportunity and of course INGSA itself uh, for this great discussion, which I hope uh, was interesting for everybody, certainly was extremely interesting and um, insightful for me. So thank you very much. And I share that uh, uh, sentiment and thank you, Sabina, for um, uh, really interesting, challenging um, and thought-provoking uh, questions. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have retired after all, but actually I'm glad I did. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel Serowitz and Sabina Leonelli, for this compelling discussion.